In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, enlighten our hearts to see the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our minds, that we may know the things that are of God. Come, Holy Spirit, into our souls, that we belong only to God. Sanctify all that we think, say, and do, that all will be for the glory of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. So, today, we are doing the book of Haggai. Haggai. Makes me think of Haggis. I don't know why, but um, anyway. Um, so, Haggai is one of the three last books of the Old Testament. Uh, one of the, the three last, um, well, post-exilic books. The three books written after the exile. Okay. And um, we looked at Zechariah last time. And Zechariah was really cool because it, he, he has so many of those prophecies that were messianic prophecies and all fulfilled by Christ. So it was really interesting and, and that's what started us off. But today we're going to look at Haggai and it's, we're going to finish it today because it is two chapters long. Ah, my God. H-A-G-G-A-I. But I think that in your Douay Reims version you might have a different spelling. Yep, same same thing. Okay. So so Haggai, um, he wrote. He started writing two months before Zechariah, something like that. Very very close to Zechariah, and they overlap. So Haggai started off, and then ended, and then Zechariah just continued writing. Right, and um, if you remember how um, Zechariah wrote. Um, well, there were two sections to Zechariah. The main guy, Zechariah, who wrote the first half, and then a different person completely, which we call Deutero Zechariah, but it's not referred to that in the Bible, um, and he wrote the second half, right? So um, the book of Zechariah spans a longer period of time, whereas the book of Haggai was written basically across four months. That's the length of time it was written in, because it's only two chapters. So that's nice, nice and short. Hey, there he is. <laughs> okay, and um, what do you need to know? Um, so um, the Samaritans, here, here's a note from my uh, New American Bible. It says, um, post-exilic prophecy began with Haggai who received the word of the Lord in the second year of Darius, 520 BC. Now remember, Darius was the king of Persia, and he had taken over after um, Sirius, Cyrus, Cyrus. See my name thing? Cyrus, okay. <clears throat> and it was um, under Cyrus that the Samaritans were trying to, to block the rebuilding of the temple, not allow it to happen. But under this guy, um, Darius, um, the Jews were finally allowed to rebuild the temple, allowed to begin it. And even though they were given permission and they laid the foundation, they didn't get any further. They just didn't do anything. They were just kind of um, tired, exhausted, nothing was working out for them. They were a conquered people and they had that spirit of kind of um, a that spirit of being conquered, that depression that kind of set in on them. <clears throat> so they weren't doing anything, and that's where Haggai comes along, and he tries to get them going, right? And so he's, he wrote two chapters. The first chapter is um, his encouragement to the people that they should actually, um, you know, begin to build this temple. There's good reasons why, and so it's more of a a narrative that's that's quite historical, right? And he, and he writes that first part, and it's straightforward, very clear, easy to understand. We're going to go through it, but it's nice and, and and simple. And then the second chapter is when the oracle is added, the prophecy is added, just to encourage the people with the prophecy um, to to really um, be zealous, I guess, for the rebuilding of the temple. Okay, so, so that second part might be a little bit more difficult to understand, but even not nearly as difficult as all those oracles of Zechariah, 
those were some freaky oracles. Do you remember those? Yeah, okay. So let's start <clears throat> chapter one. Okay. On the first day of the sixth month, in the second year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. <clears throat> Let me just remind you, um, Zerubbabel, his name, it's a weird name, right? Who would name their son that? But um, think of it as two words, Zeru, um, kind of meaning offspring of Babel, Babylon, okay? Um, so he was born in Babylon during the exile. So he is an offspring of Babylon. But not, not claiming that he is um, not a Jew, had nothing to do with that. Basically, he is the Davidic heir to the throne. So, so the Davidic monarchy continues with him. But um, the name that he was given is simply to commemorate the fact that he was born in the Babylonian captivity. Okay. So, verse 2. Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, Not now has the time come to rebuild the house of the Lord. Okay. okay. Then this word of the Lord came through Haggai, the prophet. Is it time for you to dwell in your own um, paneled houses while this house lies in ruins? Now thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but have brought in little. You have eaten, but have not been satisfied. You have drunk, but have not been exhilarated. Have clothed yourselves, but not been warmed. And he who earned wages earned them for a bag with holes in it. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up into the hill country, bring timber, and build the house that I may take pleasure in it, and receive my glory, says the Lord. You expected much, but it came to little, and what you brought home I blew away. For what cause, says the Lord of hosts, because my house lies in ruins, while each of you hurries to his own house. Therefore the heavens withheld from you their dew, and the earth her crops, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the grain and upon the, the wine and upon the oil and upon all that the ground brings forth, upon men and upon beasts, and upon all that is produced by hand. So let's stop there for a second. Okay. So God is saying to them through this prophet Haggai, um, what was that first sentence? Uh, consider your ways, right? No, what was it? Now, not now, has the time come to rebuild the house of the Lord, verse 2, right? So, so the problem is this. The people are now basically free, in a sense, not totally free, not free to totally govern themselves, but given a lot of leeway, right? Given a lot of freedom in terms of they're permitted to rebuild their temple, they're permitted to practice their religion. And with this permission, um, you'd expect them to, to really get excited and start building. But they are um, slothful, they're lazy, they just don't want to do it, right? They're busy about their own work and it sounds like they're going through a very difficult time. There's droughts going on at this time, the land isn't producing the yield of the crops, the fields are overrun, um, they're tired, they're exhausted, and nothing is working out for them. And the oracle of, of Haggai is explaining to them, the reason nothing is working is because you're trying to build your own houses, but God's house is lying in ruins, right? You're not putting God first, right? And when you don't put God first, everything else is going to fall apart. So that's the message that, that they've been given here. You're struggling in vain, and it's going to continue to be a vain struggle 
until you build the temple, until you invite God back into your lives, until you put him at the center of your lives. So that's the, the basic message that they, they've been given here. One of the things I did want to point out um, was here, verse, uh, well, verse 6 is a long verse, but the very bottom part here, and he who earned wages earned them for a bag with holes in it. Right? Well, this, this is one of those little passages that indicates something, um, indicates the fact that they have coins, right? Coins came into existence in the 7th century before Christ, and um, so we know that this is after the time that they have coins, right? So little things like that, that's how they, they kind of try to figure out dates, right? Because the dates that they're recording are not always what we would consider the exact same date because the years didn't correspond with our years, right? So um, anyway, that's an interesting little tidbit. Hear what he says in verse 8, go up into the hill country, bring timber, and build the house that I may take pleasure in it and receive my glory, says the Lord. So go build, build the temple out of timber. Well, there were parts that were built out of timber. timber. But what's interesting is that he doesn't mention the stones, right? You're supposed to build it out of stones. Well, why wouldn't he mention it? Well, because the entire city was a, a city of, of stone ruins from the first temple. And so the, the stones were everywhere. They didn't have to go in search of them. They just had to reassemble all the stonework. Mm. Um, the last, uh, verse 11 there, it says, and I called for a drought upon the land and upon the mountains, upon the grain, upon the wine, and upon the oil. Okay, Grain, wine, oil. And it's interesting, when you consider those three things, these are our staples, you could say, of their food, right? What they would be eating, but these are also staples of their worship. Okay, The, um, the grain offering, the wine offering. Uh, the grain offering would represent what was offered during the Feast of Pentecost, the, the grain uh, from which they made bread. The wine offering would be representing the Feast of Tabernacles, and that was in the fall. Uh, Pentecost would be spring, Tabernacles would be fall, and in the Feast of Tabernacles uh, they would offer libations of wine to the Lord, and oil, they would offer oil. And it's interesting that in our own Catholic tradition, we see all three of these elements used in the liturgical rites, right? We have the oil of chrism, um, oil of catechumens, and oil of the sick, as well as the, the bread and wine. And those are the most significant um, material elements that we would use um, as sacramentals for uh, worship. And of course, the bread and wine um, used for the Eucharistic celebration to be turned into, right, consecrated into the body and blood of Christ. Okay, so that's the, his exhortation. That's what he, Haggai says to the people. Now, how do they respond? Well, verse 12, okay, chapter 1, verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheatliel, and the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and all the remnant of the people listened to the voice of the Lord their God and to the words of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared because of the Lord. And the Lord's messenger, Haggai, proclaimed to the people as the message of the Lord, I am with you, says the Lord. So. This is perhaps the most successful prophet in all of Jewish history. It's the only time you have everyone actually obeying and immediately responding. And it's, that's one of the um, uh, reasons, you could say, why Haggai um, didn't prophesy much. <laughs> because most of the other prophets had to keep repeating and repeating, and giving different oracles, and, and they, because people weren't listening. And it was again, come back to me, return to the Lord, stop doing what you're doing, uh, this is what you're doing, it's bad. And, and Haggai had to say it once, 
and they listened. So <laughs> his job is done. So why, one of the reasons why it's suspected that his prophetic um, tenure was so short, right? It's kind of cool. So you have here Zerubbabel representing the, um, the governing body at the time, right? Joshua representing the priesthood and the remnant of the people. So all the people of God that had returned. Everyone together unanimously responded and said yes and started re rebuilding the temple. And in response to their response, right, Haggai in verse 13 gives a proclamation. He proclaimed to the people the message of the Lord, I am with you, says the Lord. Right? I am with you. And that, I think, is, is one of the most comforting pieces of, of prophecy that he gives there. Right? I am with you. Verse 14. Then the Lord stirred up the spirit of the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatliel, and the spirit of the high priest, Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people, so that they came and set to work on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month. So that's just a, a summary statement of what's happened. Um, that day, though, was commemorated from then on, right? The 24th day of the sixth month. And you can see how nice and clean that first chapter is, all right? Very simple, very straightforward, very good. And we're half done. Isn't that amazing? Yes. Straighten it in my mind. They had been captured. They went to Babylon. Darius let them go back to Jerusalem, but he, they were still under his power. Okay. So, so um, the Babylonians were conquered by the P Persians, and so Darius was a Persian king. And when he came into power after uh, Cyrus was the one who conquered um, Babylon, right. and then after Cyrus came Darius, and when he took over the throne, he didn't care about the Jews so much, and he gave them permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild their temple. And they still have to answer to still have to answer. They still don't have total authority, but they're given a lot more freedom. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Okay, so chapter two. So now what happens is um, he adds this oracle of prophecies and, and he gives it, it's interesting, he gives it in different stages. So um, first he gives one little section, then two months later he gives another little word and then another little one, he gives another, but all within a four month period. And um, this is yeah, again, I think it's a much simpler prophecy, again, than Zechariah ever gave us. And it comes in three parts, basically, three parts. So here, um, chapter two, first part. It's got that big, long introduction again, I just with all the names. Okay, let's do it. In the second year of King Darius, on the 21st day of the seventh month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Tell this to the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatliel, and to the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak, and to the remnant of the people. Okay, and he goes on with his prophet, his prophecy. Um, but before we actually look at the prophecy, I wanted to point out something because it's quite important when this oracle is given. Okay. It says it's on the 21st day of the seventh month. Okay. Any guesses as to which feast this is in the middle of? Well, at, toward the end of the... If you want to name a feast. Not Passover. Pick another one. Tabernacles. This is during the Feast of Tabernacles, and Tabernacles is a seven-day feast, okay? Seven days. Now, this is important because the Feast of Tabernacles um, 
was associated with the rebuilding of the temple, with the original building of the temple and with the rebuilding of the temple. And it was associated also with a messianic um, kind of a, a prophetic feel. Okay, so, so the Feast of Tabernacles is really important as the backdrop to this prophecy. Okay, so in the, um, so this is the second last day of the feast because so, the feast always goes from the 15th day to the 22nd day of the seventh month. Okay, and so this is the 21st day, so it's almost over. And um, does anyone remember what happened uh, with, with Solomon during the Feast of Tabernacles? Any ideas? Well, we're going to look at it, aren't we? Let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 8. 1 Kings chapter 8. Kings and Chronicles, right? It's a... First Kings chapter 8. And we're going to read through uh, 1 to, to 11. Okay. At the order of Solomon, the elders of Israel, and all the leaders of the tribes, the princes in the ancestral houses of the Israelites, came to Solomon in Jer Jerusalem to bring up the Ark of the Lord's Covenant from the city of David, which is Zion. All the men of Israel assembled before King Solomon during the festival in the month of Ethanium, the seventh month. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark. They carried the ark of the Lord and the meeting tent with all the sacred vessels that were in the tent. The priests and Levites carried them. King Solomon and the entire community of Israel present for the occasion sacrificed before the ark sheep and oxen, too many to number or count. The priests brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place beneath the wings of the cherubim in the sanctuary, the holy of holies of the temple. The cherubim had their wings spread out over the place of the ark sheltering the ark and its poles from above. The poles were so long that their ends could be seen from that part of the holy place, adjoining the, t the sanctuary. However, they could not be seen beyond. They have remained there to this day. There was nothing in the ark but the two stone tablets which Moses had put there at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites at their departure from the land of Egypt. When the priests left the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord so that the priests could no longer minister because of the cloud since the Lord's glory had filled the temple of the Lord. Okay. So why are we looking at that? Well, first of all, it's because once the temple is built by Solomon, and do you remember how long it took him to build it? Like how many years it took? Seven years, which is crazy fast. Crazy fast. Like outrageously fast. A lot of people don't know if it's accurate, but it doesn't matter. It's a mystical number for us, right? It means the covenant. It's the place of the covenant. And so um, they rushed to finish it in seven years. And on the seventh month, during a feast that takes seven days, the Feast of Tabernacles, they bring the Ark into the Ark of the Covenant, right? And the seven means covenant, right? That's what the number seven means. So they take the Ark of the Covenant, put it in the Holy of Holies in the temple. And what happens? Do you remember? The glory of the Lord fills the temple. Now this is such a big deal. This is such a big deal because for years they were traveling through the desert and the big lesson that they were learning in the desert as they were following the Ark of the Covenant, um, and actually, 
let me remind you, um, the Shekinah glory cloud, or this cloud that they're talking about, right, that filled the temple, this, the glory of the Lord, it was the glory of the Lord that would lead them, right? Is the, it was this pillar of fire by night and cloud by day. So it was this, almost like a, a tornado of fire, and the smoke from the fire would make a cloud around it on the outside. So during the daytime, you'd basically see this pillar of fire, sorry, pillar of smoke. But at night, you could see into, into the pillar and you could see the fire on the inside, right? So it was a cloud, but not a cloud of, of air vapor or something. It was a cloud of smoke, okay? So that's what they were following. And this cloud would come and descend. And when it would come down, it, um, it would settle upon the Ark of the Covenant. And the Levites who had the poles that were carrying the Ark around, the Ark was that big box with the cherubim on top, right? And so the poles um, would, because nothing could touch the Ark of the Covenant, only the poles. And you all know I'm Polish, so yeah, it's my heritage. <laughs> I'm very proud. Only the poles could ever touch the ark. So, so we would, we would uh, carry the ark, right? And it was the Levites that carried us, the poles. And they would place, the pla put it down, right? The ark down. And then the glory of the Lord would descend upon it. And they would all back away so that they wouldn't be um, kind of consumed in a sense. Well, not consumed, but just in the midst of the cloud. They would just back away from it. But then when the cloud lifted, they would go back and lift up the ark and make sure that they carried it underneath the pillar that was above them, okay? And it was the pillar that led them through the desert for 40 years. And the journey that normally would have taken from point A to point B and took 11 days, Father George, an 11 day journey turned into 40 years because there was a lesson they were learning and that lesson was, follow me, right? So in the Old Testament, God was teaching them, follow me. He was teaching them through actions. In the New Testament, Jesus could just say that, follow me, right? And they all, okay, they get it. But, um, so they were following this art. Now, there was a change, a sudden change at this point that we just read about in 1 Kings chapter 8, when the people on their own took the Ark of the Covenant and put it into the temple. And they stood back and waited to see, would God follow them, right? For 40 years, God had been leading them. And now it's, they flipped it around. They built a temple, a house for the Lord. And, and it was a, a crisis moment in a sense because they wanted to have God dwelling with them, but that meant they no longer could be a nomadic people. They could not, no longer travel from place to place. They settled permanently in one spot with God, with their God, right? And so they picked Jerusalem, they picked the temple, and this was to be God's home, his temple, the house of the Lord. And so the question was, does God, whom the universe cannot contain, does God want to be held captive in a sense and dwell only in one spot on the face of the earth, right? Because, sorry? Didn't um, uh, King David say that, was it, was it a prophecy when King David said something like, I'm not sure, um, that he knew that Solomon would build the temple and that mm -hmm. Solomon um, was going to be the only one that would be in the temple and that King David would never be in the new temple? Yes, it's true that um, tem sorry, David tried, he wanted to build the temple and, and he lamented the fact, here I am in my palace and you, O oh Lord, are dwelling in a tent, the meeting tent, right? Where the Ark of the Covenant was kept. And he says, this is not right. I will build for you a temple, right? And um, in response to that, God made a covenant with, with David Right? That's, that was the reason for the covenant. And, um, but God said to him, you know, you, good job, very well said. 
thank you, <laughs> but you will not build my, my temple. Your son Solomon will build my temple. And so it was a prophecy given at that time. So is this... Uh, so that's the fulfillment that we read about. They were waiting for this as well, not just for the cloud. They were waiting for the prophecies to be fulfilled. Oh, I'm sure. the cloud would come. Sure, sure, sure. And that, knowing that this prophecy was valid from King David, that there... Yeah, I was just trying to focus on, sorry. on what was connected to Haggai. <laughs> that's why I was skipping the other part. Right? But yes, there are so many other prophecies that were fulfilled with the temple as well. Besides that, there are tons, tons of prophecies. You're right. You're right. Um, let's go on. Um, I'm just mindful of the time here. Okay. So, so the seventh month with this tabernacle being built, and now God enters the tabernacle, enters the temple, okay, dwells with his people. And so... Just like in the desert, the sign that God is with us, they, every single person in the desert could see God present to them in this pillar of cloud, right? At all, every stage of their journey. That's the very last sentence of the book of Exodus, that every single person could see the God's presence with them through every part of their journey over the 40 years, which is phenomenal, right? Phenomenal. But now, now, God enters the temple, and now everybody knows God dwells within this temple. And God is present. I am with you. And do you see how it's connected with uh, now that they need to rebuild the temple? Haggai reaffirms, I am with you, right, from the Lord. That was in verse 13. We just looked at that in chapter 1. Okay, so now they're rebuilding the temple in the seventh month during this Feast of, Pas of Tabernacles. And um, so they're doing it during the same time. It's a very appropriate time to begin rebuilding. And so now, now let's go on and read the rest of it. Okay, Verse 3. Um, Who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? And how do you see it now? Does it not seem like nothing in your eyes? But now take courage, Zerubbabel, says the Lord. And take courage, Joshua, high priest, son of Jehozadak. And take courage, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. For I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. This is the pact that I have made with you when you came out of Egypt. And my spirit continues in your midst. Do not fear. Okay, um, okay so the first thing. How long was the exile, the Babylonian exile? It was 70 years, right? 70 years. So when he asked that first question, um, who is left among you that saw this house in its former glory? How many of you, in other words, actually physically were, was able to see the, the temple, the first temple of Solomon in all of its glory? You'd have to be over 70 years old probably over 75 to remember it, right? And, and you've gone through a Babylonian captivity. So, so these are harsh times. Very few people would have been left to remember that glory, right? But some could have been, very well could have been. So he's speaking to them, right? And he's saying, um, does it not seem like nothing in your eyes, right? The way you see it now, what the temple has been reduced to, it's nothing compared to its former glory. And that would have been so sad. That would have been like the, the most beautiful thing, the thing that they're so proud of as a Jewish people, the, the thing that symbolized their entire culture, their entire faith, you know, who they were as a people has been utterly destroyed and they feel destroyed, right? They echo what the temple is, has experienced. And so um, now they're told to take courage Take courage, because the Lord is with you, right? For I am with you. And then verse 5 there, this is the pact, a better word, covenant. This is the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, right? And my spirit continues in your midst. Do not fear. Now, this is a very interesting thing because we can't see the glory cloud anymore, 
right, at this point. They don't see the glory of the Lord, right? They never see it again. Um, and, and so this would have been a very sad time. And in fact, it was a purposeful thing that God did when he hid his glory. And, and I'm just going to remind you about that um, because you remember at the Transfiguration, the two significant people that show up um, and speak to Jesus, Moses, Moses and uh, Elijah. Elijah. Yeah. Okay, so they're important because they're the only other people that fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, just like Jesus fasted 40 days and 40 nights. And Moses was the one that saw God in all of his glory with all these manifestations of glory, the thunder and the lightning and the earth would quake and the, the glory of the Lord would be revealed in the Shekinah glory cloud and fire and smoke and, and all this stuff, right? So Moses got to see that. Um, the problem was throughout all the stages of their journey, even though the, the people could see God's glory in every stage of his journey, it didn't change the fact that they kind of kind of grew used to God and his presence and took him for granted. And throughout the desert, remember, why did you bring us here to, to make us die in the desert? Uh, what's the point of being here? We're, we've got nothing but manna to eat, right? Um, they're complaining about miracles. <laughs> it's amazing. Um, but anyway, and, and so the point remains that seeing God in all of his glory did not help the people remain faithful. You'd think it would. You'd think it would, but it didn't. It didn't. And so God changes tactics, and he changes tactics with the second person, right? We talked about, in, and that's Elijah. And it was under Elijah, after all the other prophets of God have been killed, right? Um, what's her name? Um, starting with a J, Jezebel. Jezebel has all the prophets of God murdered, and the only one left is Elijah. And now he's running for his life. And he has to go across the entire desert, the journey, to Mount Sinai, to the same place where Moses saw God in all his glory, right? The mountain of the Lord. And he goes there and he says, Lord, show me your glory. I want to see it just like Moses saw it, right? And, and that's when God says, I'll show you my glory, right? Go wait here in this cave on the side. And then came this huge fire and this mighty wind, the rush of a mighty wind, and there was this earthquake and lightning. And each time, you know, he, he looks out, but God was not in the fire, and God was not in the earthquake, and God was not in, in the, the smoke or whatever. Right? And in the end, there was nothing but a still, small breeze. Nothing. You could barely dis detect anything happening. And when I, Elijah heard that, he came out and he hid his face because God was present. And so there's the shift that happens from this manifestation in glory to this hiddenness. Okay? This total hiddenness. And the fact that the glory disappears and never shows up again, right, with the destruction of the temple, they're expecting, they're hoping for the glory of the Lord to arrive again. That's why they're, they're going to rebuild the temple. They've agreed to, but they want God to come back. But God has already changed the way he does things. No more this big, huge, stupendous um, sign, right, of his presence. Now his presence is going to be hidden, completely unnoticeable, right? It will take faith. It will do totally depend on people's faith. And so that's where, where we can now continue. Um, but he says, verse 5, right? Um, and my spirit continues in your midst. Do not fear. You have to trust. Just because you don't see doesn't mean God is not present. So how beautiful is that, right? My spirit continues in your midst. Okay, verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, One moment yet, a little while, and I will strike 
sorry, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will come in. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Mine is the silver, and mine is the gold, says the Lord of hosts. Greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so let me explain some of that. First, um, that last sentence, right? And in this place I will give peace. What's the Hebrew word? Shalom. Shalom. Now, our word peace means so much less than the Hebrew word shalom, okay? Shalom is the covenant peace. Shalom means there's not just the absence of war. There is actually this loving kindness, this family embrace, this um, positive um, outlook towards every single person in the covenant, right? That we are not just at peace, we are in shalom. And there is no fear that the peace will ever be taken away. It is that kind of shalom. It's the fulfillment of God's covenant promises. God is with me, everything is good, right? It's that kind of a peace. Um, and, and so that final statement there, and in this place, I will give peace, says the Lord. It's, it's the, the climax of all these promises, okay? Because it summarizes everything that they want. They don't just want peace. They, they want peace from, from famine. They don't want to worry. They don't want to, you know, struggle. They, they want to make sure everything is, is okay. And that's what he's promising with that shalom. Now, it sounds here... Right? As if God is promising um, there is going to be this manifestation of glory again. Right? This huge. It'll be even greater than the glory of the past temple. Right? Doesn't it sound like that at first glance? Right? Um, it's interesting because from history we know that it did not happen. Right? The second temple was very um, small, very... Um, um, simple, right? It, it was not ornate. The, the gold was, everything was missing. And it was Herod, who wasn't even a Jew, right? He was an Edomite king. King Herod the Great decided to rebuild the second temple because it was just so small and so, you know, unadorned. So he wanted, so that's what we typically call the third temple, even though the second temple was not really destroyed. He just wanted to rebuild it even better and add on to it and build it up, you could say. And so um, even his temple, the glory wasn't there compared to the first temple that Solomon built. But that's not the way that the scriptures, um, well, that we in the Catholic tradition would interpret this. Okay, We, we would take a look at this in a different way because... What is the temple of God? Where would we see fulfillment of this passage? What is the temple of God? The body of Christ, right? Destroy this temple in three days, I will raise it up. And when Christ comes, his body, glorified body, filled with the Holy Spirit, right? Um, is far greater than any physical structure that points to him could ever be. So Christ himself is the future glory that, that this original temple could not compare with. Okay? And, and here, so, um, that verse 7, okay, says, I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will come in. Now, when you say the treasures, right, the tre um, treasure can be used in many different ways, right? And, and the interpretation of that passage has been um, a little obscure over, over, over time. And so when you say to another person, you are my treasure, right, 
You can actually say, not silver or gold, but this person means more to you than anything. That's what you mean, right? Um, and it's interesting because in the Douay Reims version, if you, some people would have it, it would say the desired of all the nations instead of the treasures of all the nations. The desired of all the nations will come in. Because of that passage, because of that, that particular translation or interpretation of that passage, um, being that of a messianic figure, the desired of all the nations will come in, as if a person is coming in. So they looked at that as a messianic prophecy, right? And, and it's interesting. We're going to take a look at the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 26. Because here, 12.26, okay. Um, so with these manifestations that we were talking about, right, I will shake all the nations, right? And actually verse six, um, a little bit, and I will shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, okay? So that's picked up in the book of Hebrews, that language. Verse 26, it says, His voice shook the earth at the time, but now he has promised, I will once more shake not only earth, but heaven. That phrase once more points to the removal of shaken, created things, so that what is unshaken may remain. Okay, so that's how the book of Hebrews um, interprets it. The Lord shakes these things so that that which is un unshakable, which is supposed to be our faith, right, remains. So you take away all the fear, take the, allow the Lord to cleanse, you could say, or purify um, the people by letting them be shaken, right? Not stirred. <laughs> um, let them be shaken so that their faith can be made more solid. And so, um, yeah, so verse 7, back in Haggai there. I will shake all the nations, and the treasures of all the nations will come in, and I will fill this house with glory. Okay. And verse 19, greater will be the future glory of this house than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace. Now, the future glory, not only did it refer to um, Christ as as an individual person, right? Um, but it, it refers to his mystical body as well. So Christ with his, all of his members, the church, and the unshakable faith that we are given, right? So that's the glory, that's one of the ways in which we glorify God, right? And the faith that we have in him. And so, oh, where am I? Um, Verse, I'm, I'm just finishing that passage in Hebrews, chapter 26. So, um, 26, we did, let me just read it all. 26, his voice shook the earth at that time, but now he has promised, I will once more shake not only the earth, but heaven. That phrase, once more, points to the removal of shaken, created things, so that what is unshaken may remain. Therefore, we who are receiving the unshakable kingdom should have gratitude with which we should offer worship pleasing to God in reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire okay so so this idea this unshakable kingdom we who are receiving an unshakable kingdom um, that's the way uh, the Christian interpretation of this passage would would go that Christ is um, the source of this unshakable kingdom. He is the Messiah that comes and is, yeah, greater than all the treasures of the world. Okay, let's continue, continue on. Verse 10. On the 24th day of the ninth month in the second year of King Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Haggai, 
Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests for a decision. If a man carries sanctified flesh in the fo fold of his garment and the fold touches bread or pottage or wine or oil or any other food, do they become sanctified? No, the priests answered. Then Haggai said, if a person unclean from contact with a corpse touches any of these things, do they become unclean? The priest answered, they become unclean. Then Haggai continued, so is this people and so is this nation in my sight, says the Lord. And so are all the works of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. So in other words, you're carrying something that's sanctified at the altar. Haggai is claiming it doesn't sanctify anything else. It alone remains sanctified, right? But if you take something unclean and you touch anything else, everything becomes unclean. Right? And he's saying, therefore, that if you are unclean as a people, all the works of your hands, everything you produce, remains unclean. So he's, he's exhorting them as a people, they must be purified, they must be cleansed from all sin, so that they could worship the Lord honorably, because everything they do and offer God, if they are not clean themselves, the offering remains unclean. That's basically the message. Okay. What's interesting is that um, this passage, uh, it, it's, it's a criticism of the Jews, of their half-hearted response to God, right? Their, their kind of laziness in rebuilding the temple. They, they said yes, they would, but, but Haggai is still kind of criticizing them. You've got to do it with total zeal. You have to give it your all, okay? And he's saying that if you, if you don't, if you remain unclean while you're rebuilding this temple, everything you do, the temple will remain unclean. Okay, it makes sense. But what's interesting is if you take a look at the book of Ezra, now this is right before Ezra and Nehemiah rebuilt the temple. Um, because everything Haggai is criticizing, they're actually going to correct on, under Ezra and Nehemiah. Th those are historical books, so you have to go back to the historical section. right after Chronicles, Kings and Chronicles. Um, oh, what did I say? Ezra? Mm -hmm. Chapter 4. <laughs> Ezra chapter 4, verses 1 to 5. Okay. So this is historical. Okay. Um, verse 1 there. When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they approached Zerubbabel and the family heads and said to them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God just as you do, and we have sacrificed to him since the days of Ezeradahadon, king of Assyria, who had us brought here. So who, who, who's speaking here? These are the ten northern tribes that were taken away by the Assyrians, conquered by the Assyrians. Okay. These are the ones that set up their own um, capital city in the northern kingdom called Samaria. These are the Samaritans, okay, what we would call the Samaritans. Um, so the Samaritans approach um, Zerubbabel and say, we want to help you rebuild the temple. We've been here longer. We worship the same God, Yahweh, but they worshiped Yahweh in a different way. They used uh, profane ways in which to worship God. Okay, so let's read on verse three. But Zerubbabel, Yesh, um, Joshua, Yeshua, and the rest of the family heads of Israel answered them, "It is not your responsibility to build with us a house for our God, but we alone must build it for the Lord, the God of Israel." 
as King Cyrus of Persia has commanded us. Thereupon, the people of the land, the, the um, Samaritans, okay, set out to intimidate and dishearten the people of Judah so as to keep them from building. They also suborned um, counselors to work against them and thwart their plans during the remaining years of Cyrus, king of Persia, and until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Okay. So they succeeded in blocking the building of the temple until Darius came along. It's because of that passage that some Jews later interpreted this passage that we just read of God not accepting the sacrifice with, of, of unclean people because the sacrifice itself is unclean. Okay? They interpreted that as referring to the Samaritans. And because of that interpretation, at this moment, that historical event was the origin, you could say, of that lifelong feud between them, that hatred right, that continued on um, to the time of Christ. So sad. But that's not actually the way um, it was intended uh, to be understood. It was intended to be understood about the Jews, right? that they have to clean up their act. Mm. OK. Whoa, we got 20 minutes left. OK. But now, consider from this day forward, before there was a stone laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one went to a heap of grain for 20 measures, it would, it would yield but 10. When another went to the vat to draw out 50 measures, there would be but 20. I struck you in all the works of your hands with blight, scarring, scarring wind and hail, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. So that, that's just saying, that when Israel separated herself from God, the result was that she cut herself off from the sources of every blessing that God gives. God is the source of all good gifts, right? God is the source of all blessing. And so to be separated from God means not to be blessed in any way. And so that's what they're saying, you know, you go and you, you ask for 20 measures, it, the land yields only 10. You, you store up this much, you only get this much. Everything is reduced if God's not a part of it. Okay, verse 18. Consider, from this day forward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, from the day on which the temple of the Lord was founded, consider. Indeed, the seed has not sprouted, nor have the vine, the fig, and the pomegranate, and the olive tree born, yet born. That's what it says. From this day, I will bless. Oh, isn't that beautiful? So um, now that they are rebuilding the temple, now that they put God first, now that they are uniting themselves once again with God, the oracle is, is revealing God will bless them and all of their endeavors. Everything, right? And the final closing here. Verse 20. The message of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Tell this to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah. I will shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms, destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the riders with their horses shall go down by one another's sword. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Sheatliel, my servant, says the Lord, and I will set you as a signet ring for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Um, if we could turn to Jeremiah 22, verse 24. 
Jeremiah is one of the major prophets, so it's just a little bit before. So once again, Jeremiah 22, 24. We find out here this little um, 24 and 25. Okay. It says, um, As I live, says the Lord. So this is the prophet Jeremiah speaking to the grandfather, great grandfather, no, the grandfather of Zerubbabel. Okay. So um, he says, As I live, says the Lord, if you, Koniah, son of Jehoiakim, son of Judah, are a signet ring on my right hand. I will snatch you from it. I will deliver you into the hands of those who seek your life, the hands of those whom you fear, the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and the Chaldeans. Okay, so that was the oracle against his grandfather, um, this Davidic heir, okay? And um, he too was the signet, ri signet ring, the one with authority, okay, given the authority. And um, he was being punished, right? And how was he being punished? That Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, could take him and with him all of his people and all of his land. So that's what caused, well not caused, but that was the, the precipitating event, you could say, of the Babylonian captivity. And that was, and now it's being undone or um, kind of removed with his grandson, Zerubbabel. And again, in a similar type of oracle, including that signet ring um, feature. Now the reason that that's important is because it, it shows us that God is giving the authority to that particular person, right? that you are the signet ring of God, so I am using my authority through you. This is a sign of my authority. Right? It's not any other type of ring. It's not a marriage ring. It's a signet ring to show the sign of the person giving that authority. Okay, so, so finally, um, that last oracle there, that last passage, is revealing that God will save his people through the Davidic dynasty, which is here represented by Zerubbabel, but we see the fulfillment of, the, of that oracle, not in this person, Zerubbabel, but in his ultimate um, successor, who is Jesus, okay? And so Jesus is the one um, that, that, there, that this prophecy is ultimately speaking about, and the other, um, factors there. Where am I? On that day, okay, verse 23. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shephiel, my servant, says the Lord. When you hear those, those phrases, like that, that first phrase, on that day, okay, that passage, that, that phrase, on that day, it's always referring to this eschatological kind of a time period, this almost end of time on that day, or it's the day of the Lord, uh, the prophesied day, and we see the fulfillment in the Paschal mystery, right, with Christ. Um, the day of the Lord finally arrives, the hour has come, right? So, so we see Christ fulfilling all of that, and he too, Christ is the one that is referred to as the servant, my servant, because he fulfills the Isaiah prophecies of the servant of God. And so here, the fact that it says, my servant, um, again, reaffirms that as well. And he is the chosen one, for I have chosen you, says the Lord of hosts. Right? And so um, this person, Zerubbabel, he disappears after the book of Zechariah and does not fulfill any of these prophecies. But his descendant, Jesus, does. And it's in the book of Luke that he, his genealogy there is, is traced. Okay, so there we go. So in the end, Haggai, in that second section of um, oracles, gives, gives this threefold prophecy, basically saying that the 
future temple will be much greater than the first original temple. And so not in terms of size, not in terms of physical appearance, but in terms of faithfulness and holiness. And it's true that it's the people, like when you read the book of Maccabees and you hear how they're willing to, to die for their faith, they became so holy as a nation at this point um, that they far exceed, their holiness is what um, is so much more important than the physical decor of their temple, okay? That's where the glory comes from because they're united to God and ultimately it's in Christ um, that we find that fulfillment, the glory of the Lord, because Christ comes back full of the Holy Spirit, enters the temple, but he transforms it and becomes the temple of the Lord. He is the temple of the living God. And so he, in his glory, is so much greater than any physical temple ever could be. The second part of the oracle was talking about how internal holiness is much more important than, well, than anything else. And so um, that insistence that you can't offer sacrifices or rebuild the temple or anything because everything that you do, if you are not holy, will be contaminated in a sense, right? So first have that purity of heart, cleanse yourselves from sin, then you can offer sacrifice and unite yourselves with that. And then the third part of the oracle was just what we've seen, that God, um, through this Davidic heir, will fulfill his promises, right? He will save his people through this Davidic heir. And we see the ultimate fulfillment in Christ, although here Zerubbabel is the one who is named. So there we go. Any questions? Well then, let's close with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. Lord God, we place ourselves before you you who are all good, all wise, all holy. We ask you, Lord, to fill us with your grace. Lead us into all truth and show us your ways. Help us always to offer true worship to you. True worship that is from the heart, sincere, good, and holy, so that we might never offend you, but always glorify you in the, in, in the little ways that we can. And to this end, we praise and glorify your holy name in the words that you yourself have given us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.